Okay, right here, two really cool plants that thrive in disturbance. We'll start with this one. Just keeping up, you know, Fabaceae is going to be a key theme today. I know because I already saw a few. This is Baptisia tinctoria. This is the uh, Eastern False Indigo. And uh, Baptisia is, uh, I, I believe, pretty much a genus restricted to the... Um, to the east coast of the United States, maybe the east coast of North America. You probably get it in Canada, but I, I, I want to say that they get this elsewhere too. But I can always—that's the nice thing. You can always correct yourself after, uh, and you should always do that if you find yourself wrong. But Baptisia, one of these cool, you know, um, gen genera that thrive in disturbance. The thing right now, which you can't really see because I'm probably shaking the camera around, covered in wasps, covered in bees, covered in all sorts of cool plants, still doing. The triffid leaf thing, which you can barely tell because those leaves are highly reduced, evidence of the fact that it's adapted to these arid, you know, exposed, rocky, sandy habitats, and uh, just as well as uh, this plant here. One of my personal favorites. Anybody who spent some time watching the channel knows how much I love Comptonia peregrina. Cool uh, taxonomically, cool. Um, you know, just because of the ecological niche that it fills out. Pretty interesting anatomically, too. Got these wonderful leaves, delightful smell. I'm standing back from the thing of foot, and I can still smell how good it smells. It's like a cinnamony, almost like halfway between cinnamon and mint. Oh, and it just, it lingers, too. It's a very pleasant, woodsy, woodsy smell. I love how these leaves look. Sweet fern is the, co is the uh, common name. Miracaceae is the family, so a really small family. It's a monotypic genus, only plant in its genus, I believe completely restricted to the east coast of the United States as well. You get it in the Great Lakes, we get it up here in New England, and again, you know, looking out over this, most of what you're seeing is that Baptisia and this Comptonia. Um, uh, it, it's one of those plants that does the thing, it's, it's a perennial, it comes back, in fact, some of these are getting pretty big and woody. Uh, not much bigger than this though, Not definitely not much bigger than a small shrub, but um, at least not up here. But it's got these seeds that'll just, you know, lay dormant in the seed bank for decades. And then the second disturbance comes through, you get a fire, or you get what I suspect they did here, which is just cutting everything for the uh, power line easement. These guys will just spring up in the full sun. You know, usually not seen growing far from Baptisia and a bunch of the other bunch of the other stuff we've already looked at. Anyway, again, or not again, but I'm basically filming this video backwards, so I'm going to go over into the woods. We're going to walk around the side of this trail. We're going to see what else is going on. Oh, hey, you got a, get a gray birch up there, too. Betula populifolia. That's another cool uh, thrives in disturbed species. All right, now I know we just talked about Baptisia tinctoria. Don't get tripped up now. This little guy growing on the ground has flowers pretty similar, but this is Lotus corniculata. This is non-native. This is a bird's foot trefoil, and this is one, you know, same family, obviously. Kind of almost got a similar habit going on. Uh, obviously, the flowers are going to look remarkably similar, but this is, you'll see this guy on roadsides pretty much everywhere this time of year. But don't get tripped up. He's a, he's a non-native one. You've got a truly versatile species here, occupying everything from these sort of abandoned clear-cut lots to mountaintops in the White Mountains. you got a nice member of the Rose family here, Spiria alba, one of the meadow sweets. Spiria tomatosa is growing here as well. These things are always covered in bugs. Great plant to have around. Cool member of the milkweed family, Opossinum. I think this is uh, Opossinum androsamifolium. This is the spreading dog bane. Not in the milkweed genus, not in a Asclepius, but in the, uh, actually, I guess, you know, that's it. That's right there in the type genus, Opossinum. Uh, really cool. Doesn't have the same, you know, elaborate flora morphology that its, cousin, that its cousins in the genus Asclepius do. But uh, nonetheless, You'll still see this thing lit up with, you know, butterfly eggs, and pollinators, and, and what have you. Good one to have around. Yet another species, Opossinium cannabidium, which is the hemp dog bane, which kind of looks pretty similar. It's just a little bit different of a habit. Of course, I could be getting the two just mixed up. Oh, yeah. Everyone's favorite annual poppy, Capnoides sempervirens, the rock harlequin, absolutely loves these uh, exposed habitats. Surprised to see this thing still going off. I caught this thing in bloom all the way back in April, but I guess, you know, considering the fact that it's an annual, you know, it d dies and has to reseed itself every year. It's probably just, you know, adventative of when it, uh, when it decides to sprout up and bloom. We've also had a ton of water this year. Vermont's fucking flooded. 
uh, some of the worst floods since the Mother's Day floods back when was that 2005. Not not too bad here, but out west it's been it's been brutal. But uh, Capnoides sempervirens, a fumaroid poppy, fumaroidy. You know, it's got those four petals modified into a little tube. The pink lemonade flower. That's what I like to call it. But you know, I uh, you know I did all, I already did a video kind of on Boston botany from the Middlesex Fells, which I mean this is this is the same type of rock formation and I talk at length about the species so I don't really need to go that in depth into it now other than just tell you it's still going strong here in July and that's a you know that's a stunner that's a nice one okay right here Spiria alba is slightly more at least in my opinion impressive cousin get Spiria tomatosa fat ass bumblebee chilling on the thing Look at this guy lost in the sauce. Uh, get the red, get the pink flowers instead of the white, and the um, you know the floral display. How do you say it? Those little it, it's it's just got a bigger inflorescence. I don't know how else to describe. You can, you can go off the color for this one. I'm guessing doesn't have too strong of a smell, but you know some of the roses in this clade. The uh, uh, I'll put it up because I don't remember offhand. Um, you know they don't really have. Too terribly strong of a smell, I guess slightly floral, if you could call it that. The bees love it though. I think you only get to the two species of Spiria in the northeast, I'm not sure. There's an in, there's a non-native one that I think pops up from time to time, the uh the bridal uh it's got some stupid name, but I, it doesn't matter. Spiria tomatosa. That's all you gotta worry about for right now. We get a cute little milkwort here. Polyglacy is the family polygala sanguinaria, if I'm not mistaken. Get in there. I don't think these are in full bloom yet. Orders Fabales, so they're not too distantly related from the peas, and the flowers kind of look like it too. Just a weird little, uh, there's some real weirdos in this family. Gay wings, uh, Polygala Possiflora, I believe is what that one is. I'll put the correct thing, I'll put a little picture of it too. One I haven't seen, but one I would like to. It habits a much different habitat than uh, Polygala uh, sanguinea. This is the field milkwort, and you get it, you know, again, par for the course, just, you know, loving the disturbed grassy little habits. Although I always see this generally in the shadier, the shadier uh, sections. Uh, you know, here's a nice patch of them. Or, you know, maybe they're in bloom, I'm not sure. They're, they're kind of diminutive. Almost looking like a, one of those little mints or something. You know, like a little prunella, maybe. But uh, I, I like them. Uh, Polygalaceae is a cool family. Just I just always it's one of those ones that keep kicking down the line. Got some solid doggo, some goldenrod starting to go off. Which uh, oh, there's a cool bug on it. Where'd he go? Where'd that bastard go? Got a cool bug on the milkweed, or on the, yeah, on the milkweed on the goldenrod. I think this would be Saladago gentsia. If it's starting to go off, this has got to be early goldenrod because it's certainly, it's certainly not Canada goldenrod. Of course, I'll be eating my words if I'm wrong, but you got to cut me some slack. There's like 35 native species of Saladago and all North American, and all North American, uh, um, Oh, I'm screwing this up. No, I'm thinking of Liatris. Never mind. Most of them are native to North America. I think you got a couple in Europe, but very, very famous. The the uh, solid Douglas canadensis, the uh, Canada uh, goldenrod, and then Symphia trichum nova anglii, the uh, New England um, aster. When they both are going off at the same time later on in the fall, uh, I mean, they just make these beautiful, these beautiful, beautiful. Um, uh, roadside scenes where it's just purple and gold but uh, let me let me confirm if this is what I think it is I, I do believe it's Saladago gentsia you got 30 you got 35 species native to New England and unless it's Saladago sempervirens which you know a borderline succulent or Saladago bicolor which is the only one that's not yellow it also grows on a spike not a uh, not a little um, whatever you call that raceme I think um, uh, they're, they're, they can be pretty hard to tell apart Oh yeah, now it's a party. Verbena hastata, one of my favorites, a small one too. These things can get huge, like like six feet tall. Look at those little inflorescences. Verbenaceae is the family. This guy is doing great. Lots of uh, lots of uh, insects love this. The leaves do something cool there too. See so at the node, opposite at the node, but then you get two more that just immediately start to branch off. The leaves do not feel friendly. If you slide it back, 
we almost get the sandpaper texture. Desmodium canadensis has that too. Not that that's in the same family. Just uh, you'll see the two co-occurring frequently. Lovely purple flowers. Um, a nice showy, hardy uh, bastard of a plant. I think you get this in most of the United States. Super widespread species. Super cool one. Uh, one to keep an eye out for. One that's native and. Uh, just an all-around cool dude to help with your, uh, have in your, uh, you know, in your yard. This thing will grow pretty much, pretty much anywhere as far as I know. So speaking of verbena hastata, so you can see there's some right there. And then this other purple guy here, but oh no, he doesn't look, he doesn't look quite the same. And that's because that would be this, 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 uh, obnoxious invasive right here. This is Lithrum salicaria. This is the dreaded purple loose strife. So you can see those flowers look nothing like the um, nothing like the verbena flowers, nothing like anything else. It's really native. Well, I guess you do have some native Lithraceae. That's the family Lithraceae. You have uh, Decodon verticillatus, which is a really cool swamp dweller in the family Lithraceae, the pomegranate family. Believe it or not, uh, and of course it's rocking opposite, nearly uh, nearly uh, clasping leaves. Or are these world? Oh, it's got a whirl of leaves. See that there? There's three of them at the node. Oh, Jesus, it's grabbing onto me. So it'll do three at the node. Whirled leaves. Okay, good to know. Uh, I thought it was opposite for some reason. Um, but uh, yeah, real pain in the ass. Real obnoxious plant. Massive detriment to the wetlands up here on these kind of dry slopes. It's, um, you know, it doesn't get too out of control, but in wetlands, this thing can really, you know, take over and be a pretty bad problem. Lithrum salicaria. Oh, look at, see, this is what I'm talking about right here. Yeah, you can see these verbena. They get considerably bigger than what I had just showed you. Considerably, considerably bigger. This is a fantastic plant, love this guy. Yeah, okay, some up here at the top of this thing. You got your pretty typical affair for, you know, your rocky leached hilltops, your fells, if you would. Got your Junipurus virginiana laden with berries. You get your uh, Pinus rigida, your pitch pine, doing quite well, you know, kind of dominating. Oh, we get some cones on this guy. You see the cone there? I'm not going to get any close, it's actually a little ditch in front of me. Got some oaks up here. Looking for Quercus, uh, for Quercus alyssifolia, that should be up here. But, uh, hey, whatever, I'm not going to spend too much time looking for that. Oh, you get a white pine too, Pinus strobus and uh, Pinus pitch, pi Pinus strobus and Pinus rigida co-occurring. Some young sumacs, you know, a whole bunch of stuff you expect to see just in a more upland disturbed habitat. They're supposed to be a cool, there's a whole bunch of uh, rock harlequin over there. Uh, Petula papulifolia, actually that's not Petula papulifolia, that's just a... Uh, What are you? Oh, that's just a paper birch, Petula papyrifera. An actual, you know, the leaf shape. Petula folia has a much more intense, acunate tip to it. And this guy, as you can see, is sheathing bark. A lot of hate for the genus Petula, uh, you know, in some plant communities, but, you know, they're native and they're important and they're rather diverse here in New England, so I like them a lot. Petula papyrifera. It's planted out as like an obnoxious, you know, ornamental because it is a beautiful tree. So I guess if you're, you know, from someplace where that's not native, it could be kind of somewhat annoying to you. But it, again, completely native and important to the ecosystem here. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll celebrate it. And uh, there's supposed to be a cool aura banky up here, one of the false fox gloves. I'm gonna look for that, and then I think we'll probably call it a day. Yeah, there you go. There's the cones on uh, Pinus rigida. A lot. Uh, spikier, very spiky, very sharp, very unfriendly. Uh, you know, unlike Pinus strobus, that's because this is this and the two other native pines we get in New England, Pinus banksiana and Pinus rosinosa, are in a completely different section of the genus than Pinus strobus. Pinus strobus is a five needled soft pine, this is a three needled hard pine. Uh, and, um, you know, this whole tree is super unfriendly super tolerant of just the shittiest conditions. Um, I mean, as are most pines, but, you know, uh, Pinus strobus is more closely related to the, you know, 
sugar pines and um, lodge, not lodgepole pine, uh, whatever, you get the idea. It's more re closely related to pines on the west coast and pines down in Mexico. It's actually most closely related to Pinus chiapensis, which grows down in South Mexico, and then Pinus lambertiana, which is a sugar pine, which you get like Yellowstone's famous for the, for the sugar pines. Oh, here he is, Quercus alicifolia with the uh, little fruits on him, little acorns. Huh? Look at those leaves. That's an oak, my friend, but that's a scrub oak. Never gonna get much bigger than, never gonna get bigger than this. Oh, there's a white oak right behind it. You know, Quercus, underrated. Don't sleep on, don't sleep on the oaks. A lot of really cool, fascinating oaks. In fact, you got three species right here. You got a Quercus Quirk, ruba, rubra, a red oak. You got a big Quercus alba, white oak, Quercus alicifolia, bare oak or scrub oak, whatever you like. Lots of diversity in that genus. Um, just a cool family in general too, Fagaceae. You obviously you get the chestnuts, you get your beaches, you get all sorts of uh, good stuff. What else, what other, what other, what else more could you want? That's what I'm trying to say. But uh, we're gonna get close to wrapping this up. I don't know if I'm gonna find this Orbincaceae, but that's, you know, that's fine. That's, that's enough stuff to cram into one video. And in fact, as I say this, I still have to go over and there's at least, you know, two, two other cool plants that I wanted to cover, but those would have appeared to you earlier on in the video. So you've probably already heard me talk about Lobelia inflata and uh, Cianotus americanus, which I'm putting, I'm front loading those at the beginning of the video because those are two really cool plants I'd actually, you know, I really want you to stick around for. This is just the, uh, this is just the extra. Actually, speaking of um, speaking of Lobelia, I'm pretty sure that's a companion lace right there. I'm pretty sure that that's a Venus looking glass, as they call it, Triodonus. I, I can't remember the exact um, the exact uh, scientific name, but I will find out for you, and I will put it there. I'm pretty sure that's a companion that's a companion lace too. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought it was. You have to excuse my sloppy, my sloppy self. I, I usually forget common names before I forget scientific names, but this is a clasping leaved Venus looking glass, a little diminutive campanulid, family campanulaceae. That's not a lobelia or a campanula. Uh, you don't really get that many of them, but yeah, you get the little trifid, you get the little trifid stigma and everything. How about that? A whole bunch of them, most of them. Some of them got pretty big. Like that right there. Most of them are done though. That's a cool plant. Uh, I had seen it prior to blooming when I was over there at the Mount Holyoke range and I didn't get a chance to go back out into any of the sort of habitats you'd expect to see it before it uh, you know kind of fizzled out for the year but you know what that's okay there's always next year. Oh I stand corrected there's still a few in full bloom that is definitely Campanulaceae if I ever saw it. How about that? What a lovely plant. I think on that note, I'm going to leave you with this lovely scene. We'll wrap things up. Sun went away. Thank God. And, uh, you know, whatever. Didn't get to see William Philadelphia come. But you know what? Those deer that I saw running around earlier, apparently that's one of the major pests for, the, uh, for that species is deer just mow the things down, like, immediately. Um, so apparently toxic to cats, but uh, deer love it. So whatever, you know, white-tailed deer population explodes and blah 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 blah. That's why. That's why we're going to call this a disturbed habitat, and uh, we'll leave the lilium for next year. They're super short-lived flowers anyway. If you've ever grown true lilies in the genus lilium, you probably know that. Anyway, no need to ramble on. Some lovely companions for you. Asteraceae is the Asteraceae, Asterales is the order. So, distant cousins of the sunflowers, of which many will be uh, will be going off soon. We'll end things where we started.